So I get asked a lot what tools I use for engraving and I figured I'd just go ahead and make a video over everything that I use from my compressor to my engraver, everything. I even wrote some notes down so I don't ramble endlessly because I tend to do that. I use a California Air Tools compressor. The reason I really like this compressor is that it's quiet. I can have it on and still carry on a conversation with someone while we're both sitting next to it running. Uh, it's oilless, so I don't have to worry about oil getting in my filters. Uh, it's a 10 gallon tank, and like I said, it's very quiet. The big reason that your compressor not being that loud is a big plus. One, if you have a shop that's near your home, you don't want to be making a bunch of noise. Uh, some people engrave in their basement. I know. The other reason is that if it kicks on, it won't scare the crap out of you and cause you to jump while you're engraving, so being quiet is definitely a plus. I've been told that I have a little bit of overkill on my filters. Probably true, but as my dad is one to say, it's better to have and not need than to need and not have. So. I have a regulator on here, not necessary. Oh, by the way, the compressor has a regulator built onto it, so you don't need a, an additional regulator. I had this before I had the compressor, so I just have two regulators now. Uh, I keep it at 60 PSI for my engraving uh, machine. Next is I have a water separator. This takes out the bulk amount of water out of my air compressor, which lets my other filters do their job a lot better without moisture getting in them. Next is the dirt and oil remover. This just removes dirt and oil. Cleans up the air a lot, keeps it from getting in my machine. Uh, GRS, who is who I use for all my engraving tools, says that you need dry, clean air for your engraving machine, so that's what I did. And then the last part that I use is a desiccant dryer. This is probably a little overkill, but this gets out the remaining water vapors that may or may not be in the air, and I don't know if you can see, but it, it's kind of hard to tell. The bottom of it is pink and the top of it is blue, which means it has absorbed some water vapors. May or may not be necessary. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, they're not totally clear on what you do and don't need for filters for your machine. So I just went above and beyond and made sure that I was 100% good to go at everything I needed. So I use a GRS Graversmith, higher end models. This is like the beginning model from GRS. It has very basic functions. It has one spot for one hand piece. It has a strokes per minute dial. And then it has a, not really a regulator, but you use this in tandem with your hand piece to figure out how much pressure you need so that your hand piece works properly. And I'm pretty sure they have a video that teaches you and whenever you buy the machine, it comes with paperwork that tells you how to set this up with your handpiece. Because every handpiece inside has a piston. Each piston weighs a different amount, so you have to set this differently. But, you know, if you get the machine, you'll figure it out. I've, I was able to figure it out like nothing. It has a backup filter on it. So like I said, I don't know if what I have is completely necessary. Maybe you just need to hook it up and this will do everything for you. And I just did overkill. If anyone in the comments has any additional information uh, on what is what is and is not necessary for filters for the machine, I would appreciate anybody uh, letting me know. Higher end models have much more going on on them. Some of them have two spots for hand pieces if you want a hand piece for maybe fine shading and another one for deep cuts. Some of them have a spot for a rotary burr for you to do background removal with. This one is very basic. It allows me to do everything you've seen in the videos, uh, stippling, background removal, heavy lines, fine shading lines. It does everything I need it to do, so it works great uh, for my applications. All the other stuff is nice to have, but I would not say it's necessary, especially if you're just starting out with pneumatic engraving. I use the GRS Magnum Palm handpiece. I have larger hands, so it fits better. I hold it with the tube coming out between my pinky and my ring finger, and I hold it like this with my thumb. There's many different ways for you to hold it, but that's the one that I use. 
there's a lot of different hand pieces for you to choose from and I would suggest doing research on what you want to do um, because each hand piece fits your, will fit your hand differently and can be used for different applications better than others. The reason I chose the GRS Magnum Palm hand piece is that it's a larger hand piece and it just fits larger hands. They also say that it's capable of doing fine shading and heavy line work and everything in between, which for me meant it was just a good all-rounder. The one that I use the most for all my line work, shading, heavy line work, stuff like that, is a 120 degree uh, V-shaped graver. It has a 45 degree face, a 15 degree heel, and the main bottom angle is 120 degrees, like I said. Um, I have a stippling tool. Oh, and this is made, this is made out of tungsten carbide. It's brittle, but it keeps its sharpness a lot longer. I have a stippling tool made out of tungsten carbide. It's just a sharpened needle point. I have a 0.2 millimeter flat that I use for uh, background removal in tight spaces. I have a 0.4 millimeter flat that I use for removing kind of bulk background. I do very tight scrolls, so I don't have large background to remove. So I mainly just use a 0.2 and a 0.4 millimeter flat for all my background removal. I don't know what that is. Uh, some other tools that you might find come in handy. This is a brass punch that I use for inlaying silver and gold uh, into metals. You want to use something like brass because it's softer than the steel. So if you get on the steel, you won't leave marks on it, but it's hard enough to press gold and silver into the steel. So that's why you want to go with brass. Engraving machine is powered by foot pedal. Real quick, these two things that I have sitting in here are two pieces of leather. I bought an old belt from a thrift store and cut it up and I use these to line the inside of my vise so when I hold on to something delicate, I'm, I'm able to apply pressure without marring it because you don't want to clamp it in just a metal surface that'll leave marks on it. So I use a GRS low profile vise. It's shorter, like the name suggests, it has a lower profile than something like the Magnum block. It's about the same size as the standard block, I think, but it has a, it has a wider opening jaw. So I'm able to hold a larger piece in it, which is what I wanted. Uh, it's got spots for pins. It comes with four small pins and one large pin. They have a flat spot on them to hold something. The vise that you choose, it heavily depends on the kind of work that you're going to be doing. Like I said, the reason I chose the low profile is because it's it has a large jaw opening and it's bigger so it can hold bigger pieces of work, which suited my needs the best. If all you're going to be doing is jewelry, for example, a micro block would probably be a lot better suited for what you're going to be doing because you won't have quite such a big vice to turn while you're doing delicate little cuts uh, on jewelry. So it just depends on what kind of work you want to do. On top or underneath of the vice, I have a $12 Lazy Susan that I bought off of Amazon. This is extremely useful, probably the best $12 I've ever spent. The reason you want to use a turntable like this for your vise to sit on uh, is that, let's say you're engraving something like this and what you're engraving on is over here. Well, it's going to be spinning around the outside of where your focal point is for your microscope. So using this turntable, you can scoot your vise and you can center up where your engraving is underneath your vise so that it stays centered underneath your microscope. Very useful. I would say a complete necessity if you're trying to do engraving. Maybe get a better one than a $12 one. Mine kinda, mine kinda makes funny noises now. Now this is an AM scope. Uh, I think it's called trinocular, which means it has three lenses two that you look through and then a third port for you to put a camera in. Um, I never used the trinocular port 
for a camera because on this one you have to pull a little pin and I didn't know this at the time you have to pull a little pin and it takes away from one of your eyepieces for this one to be used so it's kind of hard to engrave with only one eyepiece when the camera is looking through the other one I think higher end microscopes allow you to look through both of these and have a camera so I wouldn't suggest getting this one as a trinocular it doesn't really work too well for engraving but uh, still does what I needed to do with the two lenses it's the AM scope SM 4TZ 144A on Amazon uh, that's where I bought mine it comes with 10 times eyepieces it has a variable zoom here on the side uh, it goes from 0.7 all the way up to 4.5 which is good because it allows you to adjust how much you want to zoom in this allows you to raise and lower the microscope head if your work changes height a little bit it's got a boom stand which allows you to change the height it comes with a ring light stand and it does everything I need it to do using a 0.5 Barlow lens so the Barlow lens is this very bottom one. It came with a 0.5 and a 2.0. I tried the 2.0 and it zooms in very far, but your work needs to be about this close to it, which makes it pretty much impossible to get your hand in there to engrave. So the 0.5, it zooms in plenty uh, for what I need it, and it allows my work to be this far away from my microscope, which gives me plenty of space to have my hand in there and do the work that I need to do. Some other tools that are useful is sharpeners. This is Easy Lap Diamond Hone and Stone. I got these off of Amazon. They're diamond, diamond ingrained steel plates that allow you to sharpen tungsten carbide gravers. These are very cheap and work extremely well for sharpening by hand. They make electric sharpeners with like stands, but those cost a lot of money and I don't, I just don't engrave enough to need one. If you were engraving all day long, I would say it would be useful, but for what I do, these hand sharpeners will do just fine. A straight edge is useful for, well, marking straight edges. A Sharpie and acetone will be your best friend. A Sharpie lets you write on metal in a more permanent way, but if you want to get rid of it, you can take acetone and just wipe away the Sharpie, leaving you with a clean surface. That can be more useful than something like a pencil or a scribe. I have a scribe, but I tend to not use it too much because if you mark something on the metal and you don't like where it is, you have to go back and repolish the surface to get rid of the scribe marks, whereas a Sharpie will just wipe away with acetone. And a pencil can be very useful. You just have to be careful not to draw something too big or detailed because you can wipe away the pencil and erase your work that you drew on there. So each tool has its place, just depends on what you're doing.